Democracy Now! This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We look now at how indigenous voters played a key role in Joe Biden's victory in 2020 when they helped him win Arizona, but now face a sweeping rollback of their voting rights. This comes as the top Republican candidates in close races in Arizona are 2020 election deniers, including the gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake and Blake Masters, who's running for U.S. Senate against Senator Mark Kelly. Last year, a Supreme Court ruling in the case Brnovich v. Democratic National Committee, which came out of Arizona, allowed the state to ban ballot collection from outside set precincts, which is a method that's widely used by Native voters in Arizona. The move is expected to suppress their vote. For more, we're joined by The New Yorker magazine staff writer Sue Halpern, who spoke to voters on Arizona's Navajo, Apache and Hopi reservations for The New Yorker, uh, in a new piece headlined The Political Attack on the Native American Vote. She's also a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, and she's joining us from Exeter, New Hampshire, where there is a key Senate contest going on between Maggie Hassan and General Bulldog. Also with us in Fort Apache, Arizona, is Lydia Dosella, the matriarch coordinator for the White Mountain Apache Tribe and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats. Lydia's effort to get out the vote was featured in The New Yorker article. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Sue Halpern, let's begin with you. Give us the broad picture of what's happening on Native reservations across this country when it comes to today's vote. I was very struck by one of the Native American leaders you quoted, who said, we used to talk about why participate in the colonizer's elections, who then changed his mind dramatically. Yeah, I think that what happened uh, was that in 2020, uh, Native voters understood that the election of Donald Trump was an existential problem for them. Uh, Trump was talking about opening up uranium mining again. He was talking about coal mining again. He was talking about taking sacred lands and turning them over to private industry. And so we saw this uh, remarkable increase in Native voting, even though in the past um, it was seen as a, a kind of attempt, I think, to co-opt Native voters and Native people on sovereign lands. And, and Sue Halpern, how does the, the voting process work on, uh, on the Native reservations? Because uh, there is supposedly a sovereignty that exists, a certain limited sovereignty among the, the Native peoples in terms of uh, their own laws and regulations within their territory. So how does that work in terms of a voter participation? So uh, Native Americans are citizens of the United States. They have every right accorded to the United States citizens, which they are. Uh, the problem is that the government has been very uh, lax in making it easier and, in fact, just easy for Native Americans to vote. So things like post offices, which many of us just take for granted, don't exist for many, many people. Um, a lot of people have to um, use post boxes, which cost money, can cost money, which they don't have. And so when you vote on a reservation, ideally what you would be doing would be giving your ballot to someone, uh, a friend, a neighbor, a family member who can go to a drop box, who can go to a polling place and drop off your ballot. Um, but the Brnovich decision made that illegal. Um, and that is uh, really something that will impact Native American voters this time around. Lydia Dosella, you are the Matria coordinator for the White Mountain Apache Tribe um, and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats, featured in Sue Halperin's piece. So play this out for us. Explain the issues you face on reservations and what these changing laws have meant. I mean, many say it's the Native vote in 2020 that took Biden over the top in Arizona. The Native Americans, particularly for the Apache tribe, we have made our strong, powerful matriarchs 
that we have uh, talked to and basically addressed some of the issues, such as the one that Sue Harper had mentioned earlier. And they began to, as, as they began to have their discussion and in their discussion with me, it was a how can we overcome that? Our people are known to look for solutions versus dwelling on the problems. So the solution that they came up with is that, okay, instead of having to go uh, the, using the ballot box, we will now make every attempt to go through the early voting or voting on election day, because a lot of the issues that are facing our Native American reservation are the same thing as our neighboring towns and cities within the state. And it's no difference and with our tribal elections. We have uh, pretty much the same type of election process as the state and the federal processes. So understanding that, we began to form a society of sorts, which is actually the matriarchs, because they understand their role as matriarchs, and they are very powerful women and educators. They had taken upon themselves to start talking to family members, recruiting family members that have not yet registered to vote to start registering to vote, and also making it understood that they are expected to vote to turn this whole process back around to where all Native American voices are heard loud and clear, which becomes more stronger as more votes are cast. And uh, Lydia Dasala, you ran for a political office at one point yourself. You were once a deputy director for elderly services. What are the issues uh, that uh, you're hearing uh, in terms of the uh, your particular uh, uh, people, the White Mountain Apache tribe, what are the main issues that they are concerned about in this election? The main concerns that uh, that's been reiterated as I talk to uh, from people all walks of life has basically been education, education for the children, and then also for the the, the unborn, and also social security, and then for the road system for health care. And also the rising crime is also their concern and what they feel in their opinion should be done together with the state and the federal programs to bring that back down and how it all goes back to the community. If the community becomes more active in their tribal homelands as it is off reservation, then together we can build a strong arm to where we can say, okay, we've had enough of these issues. Let's do something about a crime rate. Perhaps we need to go back to our tribal teaching to also instill in the youngsters why it's so very important to go back to who they are, their identity as a Native Americans and understanding our relationship to other people and then having respect for our lands and everything that God has created. From that understanding, I began to talk more about in depth about, okay, now Social Security, what is it about that? They have heard through the news that the Republicans have thought about, uh, okay, perhaps we need to get that invested in Wall Street and see if it can start um, making revenue on its own uh, terms. And then they didn't like that because they had worked very hard and um, depositing their retirement funds into the Social Security. And then they also talked about the health system, you know, the health care. We had, uh, with all the, the, what happened with the pandemic is where the Native Americans had thought very deep and hard about health insurance, what we done, what needs to be done. And then the other one is the education. In order for our children to have the same opportunity as those off reservation, they begin to understand that education is very important. And they want to have the same type of education that's offered elsewhere in the state and the reservation. On the reservation, we have shortages of teachers. We have substitute teachers for well into the school year. And the children do come home and then explain that we had a substitute, substitute teacher that was different from last week. And next week, we have another one that's probably going to be different. And there is no continuity in their teachings. And their children feel that they are not learning or being taught as are their counterparts. And that's where the, the grandparents and the parents and other members of the community have it all said, okay, what do we need to do? And that's where in visiting the matriarchs, 
we have all began to understand why it's so very important that we need to come together. When we cast our votes, it become loud and clear that these are some of the issues that people that are elected that will be in these offices will no longer ignore us, but yet they will remember how loud and strong we came out by the elections result, how many votes were cast on Native American reservations. And time and time again, the elders have stressed that the times have changed. We also need to educate ourselves and to meet the changes of the new world. People always say that we can't, you know, we're not living in um, whippy wiki ups anymore. We have houses here. We also have housing shortage. But all of that is no different from the rest of the world. We also need to meet the demands of unemployment, health care, and education, and even a need for other programs. And also very important in talking to these elders was a preservation of our civil rights, which is voting. Well, And having that understood, a lot of uh, elders have, of matriarchs, and this, in my opinion, my particular case, having uh, made every effort to get their family members that are not registered to have them registered. And we were able to get uh, voter registration applications to them. We also helped them get it and have them mailed back. And we also, uh, in some cases, some have driven them back to the county office in Holbrook. Well, Lydia Dosella, we want to thank you for being with us, Matriarch Coordinator for the White Apache Mountain Tribe and the White Mountain Apache Tribe and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats. Featured in Sue Halperin's New Yorker piece, The Political Attack on the Native American Vote. Sue, we'd like you to stay with us. We have two questions on pieces you've written. We're talking to you in Exeter, New Hampshire. Uh, the Guardian newspaper reported last week a New Hampshire school has rebuked the Republican U.S. Senate candidate Don Bulldock for claiming school children were identifying as furries and fuzzies in classrooms, using litter trays and licking themselves and each other. In the audio, Bulldock said, guess what? We have furries and fuzzies in classrooms. They lick themselves, their cats. When they don't like something, they hiss. People walk down the hallway and jump out and get this, get this. They're putting litter boxes, right? They're the same people that are concerned about spreading germs, yet they lick themselves and then touch everything. And they're starting to lick each other. I mean, it is astounding. It is a refrain that is being used by Republican candidates around the country. Get litter boxes out of schools, though they aren't in schools. But this general, also fiercely um, anti-choice, uh, Trump ally, is in an extremely close race with the Democratic incumbent senator, Maggie Hassan. What have you been finding there? You know, it's really interesting. Uh, I went to General Baldock's last town hall meeting, which was last night. Uh, it was very well attended. And I expected a kind of Carrie Lake, you know, just rabble rouser kind of uh, chest thumping guy. Um, in fact, he came across as being very reasonable, um, moderated tone, um, friendly. Uh, he said nothing about furries. He said very little about abortion. He said almost nothing that was sort of off the general um, Republican playbook. It was it was quite interesting. Um, obviously, he really hasn't walked back a lot of the things that he said in the press, um, but he didn't mention any of them last night um, in his uh, attempt, I think, to kind of calm the independent spirit of, of re Republican voters here in New Hampshire who may not be sort of all in for Trump, um, but are all in for the Republican agenda. And your sense of what it would signal if uh, Maggie Hassan loses, loses uh, this race uh, tonight, what it might signal for the uh, overall uh, Democratic hopes of retaining uh, the Senate and the House? Yeah, I mean, if Maggie Hassan loses, uh, the Democrats might well lose the Senate. Um, I think that Baldock has actually run a very, very vigorous campaign. He's been campaigning for two years. He's gone to every single town and city in this state. Um, he knows a lot of people. He, you know, and I think that 
you know, people want to feel like they're being heard. And, you know, there he is. He's, you know, he's there. He's listening. So, you know, it's a very swingy state, New Hampshire. They like to break the mold. Um, and this might be one of the ways that they do it. They also have a very, very uh, vigorous young uh, congressional candidate named uh, Caroline Levitt who um, is also very popular. She worked for Trump. She's much more of a Trump cheerleader, I think, than Baldock, who was not endorsed by Trump, who, but, you know, who clearly subscribes to sort of the Trump sensibility. Finally, we have less than a minute, but you just finished a piece on election software, particularly in Georgia. Uh, what did you find? So there's a county in Georgia called Coffee County, which, by the way, is a, a deeply Republican county. But Sidney Powell, Trump's lawyer, paid uh, a forensic company to go in there and copy all of the election software uh, in Coffee County. But it turns out that Georgia uses the same voting machines and software on all of its voting equipment. Um, that uh, attempt to, or not, it was actually, you know, a very successful. Uh, attempt to copy all of the software and all of the data was then given to um, some election deniers um, who we've seen uh, active in other states. And so we don't really know, you know, what they might do or have done with that software. Hopefully, you know, the, the kinds of protections that are in place will make that very hard to, um, to use, but we just don't know.